Thank you very much, and uh, it's a real uh, appreciate this opportunity to share with you uh, some of my views about, I think, one of the major challenges that are going to be facing Africa and the other uh, less developed countries uh, as they go forward. Um, there's a, a, a widespread uh, uh, recognition that, that uh, in East Asia, there was greater success than anybody had uh, anticipated. Um, the unprecedented growth entailing uh, in closing the gap in income per capita uh, with the advanced countries. Uh, back in the late 80s, uh, the World Bank asked me to do a study of, of what made uh, those countries uh, so successful, and I visited all, all the countries, and we wrote a report, uh, and uh, that eventually, uh, in a watered-down form, got published as a book called The East Asia Miracle. Uh, and some of what I'm going to be talking about is the insights I got from uh, that study about uh, at the core of our view was that the governments had played a very important role as a development state, using industrial policies to promote uh, manufacturing uh, and promote, in particular, export-led manufacturing growth. But the question uh, that's increasingly apparent for uh, developing countries today is that that model that was the basis of the success of East Asia uh, won't be available to the same extent uh, for Africa going forward. Uh, the success uh, of, of East Asia, just to reemphasize, was made very clear by the session yesterday that Deepak uh, Naya uh, chaired, uh, that Gurner Murdahl 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, wrote the book called Asia Drama, where he's uh, said uh, the prospects for Asia going forward are just really bleak. It'll continue to be mired in the poverty for which it had been for centuries. Uh, maybe the important lesson uh, of Murdoch's work is that economists shouldn't make predictions, uh, or at least when they do, make sure that they're two-handed predictions. Uh, he was too unambiguous. Uh, and as always, you know, just at the moment that East Asia was about to take off, uh, he was saying it would never, uh, never do that. But uh, it did take off, and, and obviously everybody wants to imitate what it did and hope that they can get the same results. But the world today, 50 years later, is different from what it was uh, in uh, 1975, 1980, and that means what worked then may not, and I'm going to argue won't work today. The reason is that it was the victim uh, of its own success, that there were increases in productivity in manufacturing have exceeded the rate of increase in demand, uh, and the result of that is, if productivity increases uh, faster than demand, employment is going down. And one of the main challenges facing uh, Africa is going to be providing jobs for the very large number of individuals uh, entering uh, the labor force. In fact, uh, the most of the increase, all more than 100% of the increase in the labor force, net is going to be occurring in Africa. Uh, the, uh, globally, the, uh, just since 2000, the share of GDP that is associated with manufacturing has gone from 19% down to 15%. And because employment is going down faster, the share of employment is going down uh, even more. Uh, some of this uh, is, uh, art, uh, is, is a way we keep books. That is to say, there's been vertical disintegration. That means we have to be careful about interpreting the numbers. But it's unambiguous that uh, there, there just isn't going to be enough jobs in manufacturing to uh, address 
uh, the increase in, employ uh, in labor force in Africa. And in many ways, uh, the problem that we're facing, the world is facing today, is similar to that that confronted the world a century ago in, in, in agriculture. Uh, in the 19th century, and in many developing countries today, uh, it takes about 70% uh, really, uh, of labor, uh, the labor force, to produce the food that people need to survive. But now in the United States and in Europe, uh, two to 3% of the workforce provides more food than even obese societies can consume. So uh, we've had to redeploy the labor 70%, number may, may be only 60%, uh, going down to 3%, that vast amount has had to be redeployed in other uses. And that, that was what, uh, uh, a large part of that was absorbed by manufacturing. Well, today, it's the same problem. All these people in manufacturing uh, are going to have to be redeployed uh, somewhere else in the economy, and, and I'll talk about what that means. Uh, one way of thinking about it is, um, even with the newly developing countries taking a larger share of the manufacturing jobs, um, and with the shift of jobs from China to Africa, the new manufacturing jobs will only absorb a fraction of the new entrants in the labor force. Uh, the, at the same time, those jobs can have a, impacts that are disproportionate to size, so I want to make it clear I'm not arguing against manufacturing. What I'm really saying is it will not have the central role that uh, it did in the context of the East Asia miracle. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit later. Countries may have a, a, a natural comparative advantage in some niches. Uh, in some cases, uh, even be able to create a, a, a comparative uh, advantage uh, that is more uh, 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 persistent, um, but it is unlikely to have impacts that the manufacturing-led, export-led growth model had in China and East Asia. And there's one other aspect of this that's uh, important to grasp. Uh, the advances in technology in manufacturing have been labor-saving, so that labor is becoming a smaller and smaller fraction of the cost of production. And that means, just think of it in the limit, when labor isn't there at all, the relative price of labor doesn't matter at all. So if the share of labor is a really small share of production cost, then relative cost of the savings that you get in, uh, uh, by having less uh, expensive labor isn't as important. And other things like logistic cost become more important. And that's why you're beginning to see some onshoring uh, of manufacturing, where they're having robots doing the production and, and the real focus is on saving transportation costs. So uh, what I wanted to do then is to, in this talk, what I'm gonna to try to do is, is present an alternative strategy to export-led manufacturing growth. Uh, that will, I think, be the core of the strategies for, for Africa. But I want to set it uh, in the context of what might be called the new thinking about development. So in this next section uh, of, of my talk, I'm going to describe uh, uh, some of the new ideas uh, and try to explain the ways in which these new ideas really are very counter to the Washington consensus ideas that uh, have prevailed for a very long time. Uh, the, uh, I ha I being here at Wider, I can't help but reflect on the fact that uh, just a uh, little over uh, 20 years ago, uh, I was invited to give the annual uh, Wider lecture. And I, I uh, was the uh, chief economist of the World Bank and I chose Wider as the, uh, a place where I could explain what was wrong with the Washington Consensus. And uh, it was about more instruments, broader objectives. 
And in many ways, uh, this is a continuation of that dialogue that uh, began then. So the first idea is that what separates developing countries from developed is not just a disparity in resources, but a disparity in knowledge and institutions. The disparity in resources was what provided the motivation for the foundation of the World Bank. It was moving capital from developed countries to developing countries. But uh, more than that is required. Uh, I argued uh, that development entails a structural transformation. Now, there are some countries that have had growth without a structural transformation. Uh, those are countries, uh, some small countries that are had the good fortune of having a lot of natural resources. They discovered the natural resources. Uh, their GDP goes up, but there isn't. Uh, it's not really sustainable development. It's not the uh, because they don't have the structural transformation, they're not really, all they're doing is producing natural resources. So don't confuse an increasing GDP with development. And uh, uh, that kind of growth uh, won't be sustain, uh, sustainable. Uh, markets on their own aren't able to manage these transformations very well. And they're a good set of theoretical reasons why that's so, uh, there are critical impediments imposed by capital market imperfections. There are important ex uh, inform externalities and coordination failures. Just to give you one example, uh, the sectors that are in decline, the value of their assets, their land, uh, their human capital, are less valuable precisely because they're in decline. And yet those are, the, play, uh, those are the, the units of production, the people, the firms, that have to make the investment to go into uh, the new economy. But they don't have the resources to do that without public assistance because of capital market imperfections that are now very well explained by standard economic theory. And that is why uh, government uh, needs to play uh, a very important role. Uh, and this, this uh, understanding, uh, these understandings have led to a movement from a focus on projects to policies and then onto institutions. You realize and it's, just, it's not just building a road, but it's a, a, a deeper structural transformation of the society. Um, so it's not just physical capital, but it also includes human capital, social capital, and knowledge capital and uh, a change in norms and mindsets. And that was one of the uh, really important uh, uh, perspectives that was brought out in one of the World Development Reports that was done under uh, Kaushik uh, that, that, that focused explicitly on the change in mindsets and the change in norms uh, uh, within society, uh, bringing in behavioral economics into uh, uh, development practice. And uh, among, obviously, one of the changes is a change in the mindset that change is possible, a movement away from traditional society towards uh, modernization. And all these ideas, of course, are, are, are ideas that are often associated with uh, the uh, Enlightenment. So uh, these uh, have uh, led a group of economists uh, including a number of uh, former chief economists of the World Bank to get together in, in, in Sweden to formulate uh, a set of new principles that uh, would reflect uh, where we provide some guidance uh, to development. And I'll go through them very quickly because I want to get on to the, the, the main thesis of my uh, talk, but I, it's important to, to, to put what I'm talking about within this broader context. Uh, first is that GDP growth is not an end in itself, and there's been a lot of confusion between means and ends. Uh, development has to be inclusive. Uh, envi environmental sustainability is a requirement, not an option. There is need to balance market, state, and community. And I want to emphasize uh, the last word in, in that formulation. Uh, it wasn't just that the Washington consensus undermined the role of the state, uh, but it also didn't even talk about the role of civil society uh, 
and other forms of economic organization. Uh, fifth, uh, one has to provide macro stability. That was one, uh, one of the longstanding principles of the Washington Census. But that doesn't just mean balancing budgets or focusing exclusively on inflation. In fact, some of that exclusive focus on price stability was counterproductive in terms of real stability. Um, the uh, uh, sixth was that one had to attend to the impact of global technology and inequality. Uh, and then as we think about some of the big issues, uh, concerns about whether uh, trade agreements were fair to the United States. You know, Trump has said that trade agreements are uh, not fair to the United States. I, I wrote a, a, a book uh, about uh, called, uh, globalization and its discontents. One of the themes was that globalization uh, had not been done, uh, uh, it was done in a way that was unfair to developing countries. So I asked my students, uh, who do you think is correct, me or President Trump? <laughs> um, and my students seem to agree with me that, <laughs> that uh, the problem is not that uh, the uh, uh, global trade agreements are unfair to the United States, but they are actually unfair to developing countries. But the broader view is actually they're unfair to workers in both the developed and developing countries. It was a corporate agenda. And uh, it was done to increase profits. And workers in both developed and developing countries uh, uh, suffered. Um, and of course, as one focuses on uh, uh, problems of inequality, you naturally talk about investments in human capital, uh, creating new instruments of redistribution within and between countries, and getting a better grasp of what determines the market distribution of income, the role of the rules of the game, corporate governance, uh, uh, bankruptcy law, uh, competition policy, uh, labor policy, all in determining the market distribution uh, of income. Uh, I've already uh, mentioned uh, the seventh point, the importance of social norms and mindsets, which have proven effective ways of altering many aspects of behavior like fertility. Uh, eighth is that global po uh, focuses on global policies and the responsibility of the international community. Uh, it recognizes that as we've had globalization, it's resulted in the interdependence of countries. And that means what one country does has effects in others. But there's an asymmetry. Uh, the policies of the large, rich countries have large externalities on the rest of the world, which they often don't take into account. And that includes uh, their monetary, regulatory, trade, and migration pro uh, policies. Uh, on the other hand, the tax havens, which have benefited uh, the developed countries, um, have an effect on all countries, both on the developed countries and on the developing countries. Current international agreements cover only parts of these arenas. Uh, climate change doesn't go far enough. Uh, and particularly, they do not cover the cost of adaptation by poor countries. So uh, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the ways in which the Stockholm Statement is a marked change from the Washington Consensus with its narrow conception of goals, instruments, and participants in the development process. Uh, first, talking about goals, uh, the goals are not just the GDP, but inclusive growth. Uh, and at one time, the idea was that you could just focus on growth because everybody would benefit. And that was the notion of trickle-down economics. Uh, there's also been a change in the notion of uh, trade-offs. It used to be thought that if we had more focus on inequality, uh, pursued more equality uh, policies, it would cost society in terms of growth. This is sometimes called the big trade-off. But what I emphasized in my book, The Price of Inequality, and now has become a, a conventional wisdom uh, with even the IMF advocating it, is that greater inclusivity can lead to more robust growth. And actually, the IMF has done some of the best work, sort of providing the empirical evidence that uh, that is true. Uh, so 
That actually is derived partly from understanding some of the sources of inequality. Uh, if you have large amounts of market power, uh, if you uh, have monopoly power, then that's a distortion that gives rise to inequality, but it also impairs the efficiency of the economy. Um, employment generation is central uh, 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 to uh, inclusive growth. If you have large numbers of people who are unemployed, you're going to have uh, high levels of inequality. And that's, of course, the problem I mentioned before with the rapid growth of the population uh, in, in Africa. So uh, today, we have to see growth and equality as complements rather than substitutes. Uh, other goals that are now paramount are uh, climate change and other environmental goals and uh, a broader perspective on good macroeconomics. As we come to talk about more instruments uh, in the area of monetary policy, that's become very clear. We no longer talk just about changing the short-term interest rates, open market operations, but uh, QE and uh, macroprudential regulation. Um, but there are more instruments more broadly for macro stability. The IMF has now embraced what is called the, uh, the new institutional view on capital controls. Uh, there are more instruments for development uh, transformation. Um, one of the things that Justin Lin, when he was chief economist champion, was the use of industrial policies. Uh, and I'll talk very briefly about that. Uh, it's not just about promoting manufacturing, but agriculture and services. And uh, there are more instruments for maintaining full employment, including active labor market policies, and in India, for instance, the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. Uh, there are clear distinctions between means and goals. Uh, one of the unfortunate things is that uh, some of the development uh, agencies, international institutions, uh, took on some of the means as goals and uh, as ends in themselves. They pushed privatization, price stability, as if they were the end product that they were concerned with. Uh, but privatization and even markets are not ends in themselves. They are only and uh, only possibly means to broader goals that I described earlier. Uh, and other variables like inflation and budget deficits, current count deficits, uh, need to be looked through with uh, looked at through these lens. They are important, but they're only important to the extent that they uh, facilitate the achievement of other goals. So one has to attend to them, but one has to uh, uh, see them. Uh, as intermediate variables that may or may not be related to the uh, invariables uh, that, with which we are concerned. And then uh, finally, I want to uh, talk about uh, the greater participation in the development process, uh, the greater, better balance between market, government, and society. And uh, that begins, you know, you could say the Washington Census focused just on markets. Uh, my own work has done a lot to un enhance the understanding of the limitations of markets um, that uh, we need in our society more broadly, systems of checks and balances, and markets check the abuses of government, but governments check the abuses of markets. And media and civil society play a, a pivotal role in checking both. Uh, so... Uh, I would go further that all successful development has entailed government, all successful development has play, entailed the government playing an important role, the development state, with a multiplicity uh, of, of, of roles providing enabling conditions for markets to work. That's one thing that the World Bank has emphasized, but I've talked about th three other things, regulating markets, preventing, for instance, negative externalities, promoting development more directly, including learning, uh, one of the things that we know that if knowledge is at the center of development, markets are not good at promoting knowledge. It's a massive market failure because knowledge is a quintessential public good. So they can't do an efficient supply of knowledge in the production transmission of knowledge. Um, and uh, government plays, I think, a very big role in understanding the big picture. 
uh, including uh, the, the challenges posed by large issues of structural transformation, demographic changes, and so forth. So now I want to get into the, the main theme of, of this talk, and uh, that is first asking why was manufacturing export-led growth so successful? I call that deconstructing the success of the export-led manufacturing uh, model. And then on the basis of that to say, how can we get the elements of that success in another way uh, in the 21st century? So uh, there's a list here of, of some of the things that uh, manufacturing export-led uh, growth allow one to do. The open economy allowed one to avoid, uh, avoid the complexity of material balance equations. Uh, all one had to do was uh, have enough foreign exchange um, and export growth uh, generated the necessary foreign exchange. For most of you have uh, not had to go through this, but uh, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, planning was all about uh, making sure that you uh, had these material balances, that you had the, uh, uh, the inputs and the exports, that go, you had enough steel to do what you wanted, you produced it and you used it. But once you go into an open economy, you didn't have to have those material balance equations. Um, in a way, um, you didn't need to generate the demand to absorb the new supply. In the old world, if you produce something, you'd have to worry about was there going to be a demand for it. But if there's a global market there and you're a relatively small economy, and even India is a small economy relative to the global economy, even though it has a lot of people, uh, you're small in global supply. So you didn't have to worry about the demand constraints in general. I mean, in some small markets, you might. Um, what you had to do is worry about how you manage the exchange rate, uh, how you manage openness, uh, and uh, uh, so there, there were, there were uh, some problems you had to attend to, but it really solved, uh, reduced the nature of this planning problem. Uh, secondly, exports provided the basis of learning. As I said before, uh, a key to success was closing the knowledge gap, and uh, as part of export-led growth, in particular part of success in export, manufacturing export-led growth, uh, was the transfer of technology. And that could be accomplished in, a no, in numerous ways, for instance, foreign direct investment, but some of the countries did not do foreign direct investment. In Korea, foreign direct investment played no role. Uh, in Japan, foreign direct investment didn't play any role. They had other ways of acquiring technology. What they had in common was that there was some way of acquiring knowledge, and, and you had to do that if you're going to be successful in the export manufacturing uh, role. Um, the transfer of technology then had a lot of spillovers to other sectors. So as you started learning about manufacturing, there was a lot of the knowledge that you got and a lot of the institutions that were necessary for success in manufacturing that had benefit to the rest of society. If you were going to have a robust manufacturing sector, you had to have a financial sector, you had to have an educated labor force. And those institutions obviously affected all of society. So there were important uh, spillovers. Uh, thirdly, exports provided the basis of tax revenues, and development requires resources, resources, public resources for infrastructure, uh, resources for education, uh, for promoting health, and you, one of the uh, problems of developing countries in general is garnering resources is very difficult. But when you have these large enterprises, you could tax them. You could tax trade. So it was the basis uh, of generating large amounts of revenue that uh, previously had been very difficult to do. Uh, fourthly, it generated jobs. Uh, it generated jobs in the urban sector. And that was uh, important in, sub in supporting the structural transformation uh, and making sure that there was widely shared uh, growth. Uh, and that, and finally, is part 
of the structural transformation because as you move from a rural economy to an urban economy, as you move from a traditional economy to a, 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 an economy that was changing, you, you really did change the mindsets of the people. Uh, it, uh, and you, you uh, uh, began the development transformation that took off in East Asia. Uh, as, reflect, as we reflect on the success of East Asia, you have to reflect for a moment on the mechanisms that were used, because I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but some of the mechanisms uh, were not just direct subsidies, but things like access to credit at near commercial rates. And that provided incentives for entrepreneurs, but it limited the direct support and therefore limited the scope for corruption. Um, there were actually a, a variety of other industrial uh, policy in instruments, but it provided a natural system of accountability because the successful firms, which were the firms that got credit, were the firms that were competing in the international market. They weren't successful because they had created a, a monopoly through lobbying the government. They had to compete in global markets, and that gave a, a, a better system of accountability for what was the real basis of success. So the main thesis of, 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 of this paper is that similar outcomes today in Africa and elsewhere in the uh, developing world will require a multifaceted growth strategy with different facets reflecting different aspects of manufacturing export-led growth. So in other words, we'll have to have elements of manufacturing, agriculture, resources, services, all directed at trying to achieve the multiplicity of things that one got out of manufacturing employment growth, tax revenues, employment, learning, foreign exchange, but you're not gonna get them all packaged together in one package called manufacturing. But if you uh, do that well, uh, if they, they do that well, I think they can have a co success comparable to export manufacturing led growth. Um, one of the challenges uh, facing uh, Africa was that uh, it places, it, it confronted, uh, it suffered from premature deindustrialization. Uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, if you look at the, the share of value added by industry was 35% in 1981. And by 2016, rather than having industrialized and increased, it's now down to 23%. So rather than increasing, it's actually decreased. And some of that has to do with the structural adjustment programs uh, of the uh, Washington Consensus uh, institutions. So a second theme that I'm going to uh, come back to over and over again is that government will have to take an active role if there is to be the structural transformation that will achieve that multi-pronged uh, 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 growth objective. So let me go through very quickly each of uh, those um, four prongs. First, beginning with manufacturing. Uh, as I said before, it's, there's gonna be a limited ability to generate jobs. And uh, unfortunately, I think there's gonna be limited ability to generate uh, tax revenues. Uh, there would be greater ability if there were less tax competition. And Jose Antonio has been heading an international commission to try to uh, reform the global multinational uh, tax regime. Uh, but, uh, and one aspect of reform would be an international agreement to curtail tax competition. But in the absence of that uh, agreement, uh, unfortunately, there's a race to the bottom, and the race to the bottom means that it is very difficult for developing countries uh, to, uh, to uh, generate a lot of revenue out of, uh, out of uh, uh, manufacturing. And even more so because globalization has generated these tax havens uh, that were illustrated by the Paradise Papers and the Panama Papers, 
uh, where uh, multinationals can effectively avoid taxation uh, almost everywhere. Uh, still, I think that appropriately designed policies can play an important role. Some of the industrial policy, and I'll explain in the next section. Uh, unfortunately, the WTO circumscribes uh, the use of subsidies. And this is one, you know, when you talk, I, I mentioned before uh, that the international rules of the game are biased against the developing countries. Uh, they allow subsidies to agriculture, which are the comparative advantage of developing countries, but they don't allow the subsidies for development, uh, for industrialization that would allow developing countries to develop. And if you look at other aspects of the tariff structure, uh, escalating tariffs, the existing tariff structure is designed to keep developing countries producing low value added uh, activities. So um, uh, developing countries will have to take actions to counteract the current structure and uh, to do it, uh, they have a challenge to do it uh, within the framework of the WTO. Uh, and uh, let me just say, even though I'm very critical of the WTO, uh, it's better that we have the WTO than not have it. And uh, the problem is right now, uh, there is a real challenge to the WTO itself. I mean, I, I really think an international rule of law uh, is important and uh, it needs to be reformed, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be ended. Um, and for, uh, uh, and, the developing countries are going to have to be obviously very um, uh, careful very, 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 uh, in, in uh, uh, formulating their manufacturing industrial policies. Uh, for instance, taking advantage of their natural advantage in natural resources. Uh, let me turn to agriculture. I think agriculture for the coming decades is going to be the most important basis of employment. Uh, it is currently the most important basis. The fact that uh, it is traditional has led many, many developing countries to say we don't want agriculture. Uh, and one can understand that, you know, countries like Korea at the beginning of their development transformation were told your comparative advantage is in rice, so you should stick to rice. And uh, you can understand why they didn't do that and uh, that they have benefited from not doing that. But I think the situation in Africa is different. Uh, that the task of creating jobs in manufacturing is just beyond the ability of manufacturing to do it. But agriculture, modern agriculture, is not the same as subsistence agriculture, and that's where there's a lot of confusion. One can have a modern agricultural sector in which out of agriculture you get not only employment, but the other things, many of the other things that you got out of uh, manufacturing export uh, led growth. So it can be reconstruct, restructured in ways that are more dynamic, more learning, learning how to learn, a kind of transformation in situ. Um, in fact, uh, in the advanced countries, modern agriculture is actually very advanced. Uh, uh, there, is, there needs to be a focus on non-labor saving innovations uh, and that's really a more general point. The West has focused on innovations that save labor, creating more unemployment among skilled labor. Obviously, in a world where there is, in, a, in developing countries, where there's a clear surplus of unskilled labor, you don't want to focus on creating more unskilled labor unemployment. So innovation itself has to be focused on non-labor saving. You might even say innovations which are labor using innovations. Uh, and those include a different crop mix uh, and fertilizers. Uh, horticulture is an example of uh, uh, growing flowers as an example of a kind of agriculture which is very labor uh, intensive and has been very successful. Uh, interesting and also in earning large amounts of foreign exchange. Uh, 
you might say the good news is that because of the uh, uh, failure, neglect of agriculture for the last 50 years, uh, there is low productivity in sub-Saharan Africa, and so there is an enormous scope for modernizing agriculture. Uh, and as I said, the transformation from traditional practices to modern farming can be an exemplar of the general societal transformation entailing modernization. Um, a stronger agriculture sector can generate uh, foreign exchange, at, or at the very least, reduce the need for foreign exchange for imported goods. Um, and uh, uh, it can reduce uh, migration pressures on the cities which are a stress in uh, all, at least in many developing countries. Uh, the, this view, uh, let me say, has been uh, shared uh, by many in Africa themselves. The Africa Center for Economic Transformation uh, in Accra um, put it this way, agriculture presents the easiest path to industrialization and economic transformation. Increasing productivity and output in a modern agricultural sector would, beyond improving food security and the balance of payments through reduced food imports and increasing exports, sustain agro-processing, the manufacturing of agricultural inputs, and a host of services upstream and downstream from farms, creating employment and boosting incomes across uh, the country, across the economy. So if one exploits all the horizontal linkages and vertical linkages associated with agriculture, uh, it actually can be an important basis for development. There are a number of ways of uh, promoting agriculture. Uh, one of the things I didn't have time to talk about was why was manufacturing such a good basis for learning? And one of the reasons is you had large enterprises that can internalize expenditures uh, the, the benefits that they get from the expenditures on learning, on research. Uh, when you have very small units, which are typical of agriculture, service sector, uh, that's much more difficult. And the response to that is the government and co-ops have to take up that role. And that's, of course, what happened in the United States in that corresponding period. In 1862, the United States, in the middle of the Civil War, created the agriculture uh, universities and the agriculture extension services. And so it did the research and make sure that the benefits, the, the, that knowledge was transmitted to all the farmers. Um, I think it's very important, this is just a list and time is short, so I'll, uh, it, for the design of the IPR systems. Uh, the current IPR regimes work against having uh, the kind of agricultural system uh, that developing countries need. There is a role of government in certifying and providing quality seeds and fertilizer. It's a real informational problem. Um, in providing credit, preventing exploitation, and again, a classical problem uh, in, in uh, all countries. Uh, and providing marketing services, again, uh, a classical problem. So, uh, let me very quickly skip over the next thing on natural resources. That's a standard uh, uh, sector. Many of the African countries are blessed with natural resources, but as we know, natural resources often turn out to be a curse, but we now know how to manage that uh, through um, uh, making sure you have uh, uh, stabilization policies, sometimes through a sovereign wealth fund, making sure that you have uh, well-designed auctions to maximize the revenues that you get from the uh, value of those, and well-designed contracts uh, so that uh, they manage the volatility and make sure that uh, the, the developing countries get more of the uh, benefits. But uh, what has not been fully appreciated is that they uh, can be used as part of the development resources, a uh, development strategy. So they are, uh, too often natural resources are just viewed as a source of foreign exchange, but they can be part of their comparative advantage and be used as a basis of development. There's some very interesting work of uh, Hausmann uh, where he, 
points out that there are very weak linkages between natural resources and the rest of the economy. But that describes the past. That's not inevitable. So when he says that, he often makes recommendations based on that. But the recommendation that I would begin with is change that <laughs> uh, and uh, explore those linkages. And there are a number of cases of enormous success in doing that. Finally, uh, the service sector. Uh, in the VAX countries, the service sectors now play 70% of the entire economy. In a few of the developing countries, they've managed to make that transformation to a service sector. Uh, Namibia, for instance, has been very successful in developing, even though it has some uh, natural resources, it's realized that it can also have a high revenue tourism sector. Um, there, there are many reasons why if you don't manage uh, the service sector well, you'll wind up with low productivity. But like agriculture, there needs to be a, you might call it an extension service. And governments haven't done that, haven't focused on how to uh, improve productivity. Here the really important point is that if the service sector is a majority of the economy, or more, you know, 70% in, say, in the United States, and there are differences in standards of living across countries, it has to do with the productivity in the service sector. And yet we haven't really focused on the sources of the differences in productivity in the service sector and how we can increase the productivities in the service sector in developing countries. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, is a modern service sector, many aspects can be inserted into the global economy through the internet. Now, when we use the service sector, it's a generic term. It includes many different things, uh, education, health, housing, um, and each of these are, are different. I just want to spend a, a word on a couple of these. Um, housing service, for instance, is an area where there'll be huge demands. The process of urbanization requires large investments, and that means that there's, again, a large job uh, creation potential, including for unskilled labor. But the government will need to take a more active role because the absence of finance is critical. Private financial institutions don't do a very good job. In the United States, more than 90% of mortgages are underwritten by the federal government. So the U.S. mortgage market isn't working. How do you expect a developing country mortgage market to work? So the answer is there has to be a role for government, and I, I could describe how to do that, but the point is uh, it will need to take an uh, important uh, role. And there are huge amounts of market failures uh, in this area, including zoning, mortgage finance, uh, and, uh, uh, and so forth. Well, let me skip on. I've been told I have uh, uh, two more minutes um, and uh, uh, make just uh, three more points. The first is the, the importance of industrial policies and what I call uh, learning industrial and technology policies, uh, explicitly focusing on the role of learning. Uh, and here I just make a couple points. Every country has an industrial policy, whether they know it or not. Uh, in a way, the legal framework of a country embeds industrial policy in the United States. Uh, when we gave derivatives priority in bankruptcy over everything else, that was an industrial policy to promote derivatives. But because we didn't know it was industrial policy, Wall Street got in there when nobody was thinking about it and said, U.S. industrial policy is to promote risky product, uh, financial products. Um, government expenditures, government has to decide the structure of the education system, structure of infrastructure, that's going to be decided by government, and how you make those decisions affects the structure of the economy. So inevitably, all countries uh, have uh, an industrial uh, policy. Uh, one can structure an industrial policy uh, in ways that take care of or address uh, 
market failures, reasons markets aren't working well. They don't pay enough attention to climate change, to employment, to inequality. So there are very strong reasons for industrial policies. And most importantly, if learning is the basis of a successful economy and there are important learning spillovers, they won't pay attention to that. And that has to be a center of, of uh, industrial policy. As we think about that, there are some very big issues associated with comparative advantage. Um, and here, the important point is that the hetero lean model for thinking about comparative advantage uh, doesn't work. Uh, the hetero lean model focused on the relative uh, capital to labor or skilled labor to unskilled labor in different countries. And we say the United States has a comparative advantage in capital intensive, and other countries have a comparative advantage in labor intensive. What's wrong with that theory is it was a theory that was formulated before we had large, massive movements of capital across borders. But if capital moves freely across borders, then capital labor ratio is not the basis of comparative advantage. Comparative advantage has to be based on things that are not mobile across borders. And uh, so uh, one has to think of what is the real source of comparative advantage. And the real source of comparative advantage are the skills, health, and discipline of the workforce, embedded knowledge, institutions, and norms, uh, what I sometimes call it, refer to as institutional infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, uh, the reputation, the branding. All of these affect uh, the ability to attract and retain talent and to uh, ability to attract and retain capital. Uh, it's hard, but I think essential to change these in constructive ways, and enhancing these should be central to development, develop, uh, to, to development strategy. So the final point uh, before summarizing that I want to make is uh, how can developed countries help? And there are multiple instruments, fair pro-development global trade regime. Uh, Many of you may remember in 2001, the international community decided to have a development round of international trade talks. And uh, in December 2015, they said, uh, United States and the advanced countries said, oh, that's too difficult helping the developed country, developing countries. Uh, and uh, a very big disappointment to say uh, that you can't have a pro-development uh, trade regime, that they were uh, uh, unwilling to think about that issue. You need a pro-development IPR regime, uh, investment agreements. Those have become a major impediment to development. Um, yesterday in the discussion, there was a, uh, uh, Stephanie emphasized the, the, the role of the investment agreements in uh, impairing uh, the implementation of modern views about capital controls. Um, you, you need uh, pro-development and more stable financial markets and regulation. You need to stymie the, uh, the flow of corrupt money, sh shutting down secrecy havens, including in London and Delaware, Nevada. Uh, so it's, it's not just offshore. A lot of this is very onshore and having uh, fair multinational uh, regime, tax regimes. But uh, the thing I mentioned yesterday, and I'll just summarize it, is that there is another mechanism, which is a global reserve system to replace the current dollar-based uh, reserve system that would be more equitable, more stable, would increase aggregate, global aggregate demand of greater global growth. But the annual emissions of these global reserve systems, in other words, every year, some three, four hundred billion dollars is buried in the ground effectively in reserves. If you compensated that by creating new reserves, giving that to the developing countries, that would be three, four hundred billion dollars that could be spent for development that would help compensate for the loss of this important old technology called export manufacturing led growth. So let me just conclude very quickly. Success and development over the past 60 years was greater than anyone anticipated. Uh, there is an enormous gap in knowledge as well as in resources that has to be closed. Uh, 
Um, most of the advanced countries are, uh, are engaged in the service sector. So if there are disparities in standards of living, it relates to productivity in these service sectors. So we have to learn how to close that gap. Uh, the basis of success of growth over the past half century was expert-led growth. What we've tried to do here is to deconstruct what enabled manufacturing to provide this growth spurt, this structural transformation. It won't be able to do so in the future, at least to anything like that extent, and there has to be uh, another strategy that performs some of the essential roles that manu manufacturing export-led development did. And what I've tried to do is provide that it will need to be an explicitly more multi-pronged uh, approach addressing separately each of the challenges that manufacturing sector uh, export-led growth addressed, uh, uh, and they'll have to do it simultaneously. And I, uh, what I try to show or uh, hint at how a coordinated agriculture, manufacturing, mining, service sector strategy has the prospect of attaining the same success of the old manufacturing export-led strategy but if we're going to have the success, we'll have to, uh, government will have to play an important role. In short, what is needed is uh, maybe an old idea, but something called a comprehensive development strategy leading to inclusive growth with inclusive participation in the process of development, including a better balance between markets, government, and society. And based on these new understandings of what leads to successful in econo economic and societal transformation and creating new dynamic comparative advantages, uh, I think it, it's an enormous challenge for the development community. But I think uh, it is important for us to, to realize that we will have to come up with these new strategies. And I hope my talk has laid out in a broad framework uh, about uh, how best one can go about doing that. Thank you. <laughs>